America's war on drugs is far from over, and fentanyl is now at the heart of a dire drug epidemic. Our guest today is Ahmad Hussein, the lab test entrepreneur who invented a device that can detect fentanyl in any pill or capsule before it has a chance to end someone's life. From Ballard Studios in Washington, D.C., it's 13th and Park. The future doesn't belong to the faint heart. There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. We will make America strong again. We will get through this together. I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. And the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Ahmad, welcome to the show. Always nice to reach across the country to California from Washington, D.C. Just to have a sense that our audience now can feel completely included because it's national. Yeah, Adam, thank you for having me on the show. Big fan of 13th and Park and what you guys are doing. We appreciate it. So let's get right at it. There is a fentanyl epidemic. It's been going on for years in the country. Fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine and 50 times more potent than heroin. That's pretty scary stuff. So give us kind of a textbook primer on what fentanyl really is and how it impacts the body. Yeah, fentanyl really is some scary stuff. Um, Just last year alone, more than 100,000 people died from fentanyl overdose. Just to give you an idea, it takes two milligrams of fentanyl to lead to a lethal overdose. And that's the equivalent of two grains of sand. That is why it's so deadly. Uh, Fentanyl was actually always designed to have that type of potency back when it was developed in the 60s. It was intended to be used in a medical environment to be Mm -hmm. prescribed to cancer patients, amputees, people who just completed uh, post-surgery, debridement, so really intense surgeries. Fast forward to today, because it is a synthetic opioid, it is developed, created, and then mixed into everyday substances and distributed on the streets. It's been used in many, many drugs. I mean, it's Hmm. to everyday drugs like Xanax, Vicodin, to more intense drugs like cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, and ecstasy. It's frightening. Is is this very much like OxyContin where it it was meant to help relieve pain, but what it turned out to do more often than not is be a dealer of distress and death. It was invented with good intention, but now it's in a place of misuse and readily available. Fentanyl impacts the body by instantly binding opioid receptors to the nervous system. This leads to an altered pain perception and a euphoric high. However, its powerful nature creates a high risk of respiratory failure, Mm -hmm. um, which is why it's so fatal young people in particular, do they really know a lot about this, Ahmad? They don't. They don't even know they're consuming it. And I often mistakenly say the word overdose of the cause of death. In reality, if uh, a young person or anyone takes a Xanax and dies from fentanyl overdose, Hmm. are they really overdosed? No, they're being poisoned. And that's what's happening. And that's the problem is they are not aware they're even consuming fentanyl. But, you know, the marketing of this, I remember in the time I spent in and around Pam Bondi when she was attorney general of the state of Florida. She was fighting often synthetic drugs. Every time they legislated against a whole bunch of them, they would change the chemical formulation just a little bit, those that were making this stuff, and then put it back on the street. But fentanyl is being marketed with using names like Tango and Cash and Great Bear and Dance Fever and China Girl. It sounds harmless when in fact it is incredibly harmful. So the marketing of it, it makes it that much more enticing unless there's a clear awareness by the user that what they're dealing with here could really be fatal. Yeah, and and you're spot on. It it is very difficult to keep track of. I think drug manufacturers tend to always come up with different names to differentiate their product in the market, just like any product in the market. Their objective is to create a buzz and use clever names to appeal to specific demographics. That's why so much of our advocacy, so much of our work is regardless of the name of the substance, regardless what the substance is, you need to test the substance if it's coming from an illicit source. If it's not coming from a trusted pharmacy, you should test any substance you're consuming, regardless of the name. Did COVID somewhat supercharge this epidemic with everything that went into people not being as socially active, 
rising levels of mental distress, depression, suicide. Did that go hand in hand, unfortunately, with this pandemic? Yeah, for multiple reasons, Adam. You hit the nail on the head. Um, COVID really supercharged the increase of fentanyl overdoses. Again, it's gone up every single year, the amount of deaths we're seeing from fentanyl overdose. As you remember, during COVID, one of the biggest worldwide issues, besides the health risk, was also supply chain. No matter the industry you're in, it was hard to get any supplies for anything. You know, the drug trade is no different. So you have drug manufacturers who are producing drugs in their traditional way. Now they have limited supplies. So their response was, how can I use my limited supplies to create more drugs and maintain profitability? So that is what drove them to start using additives like fentanyl to make their substance stronger, more addictive, and more profitable. Tie that in with the stresses of the pandemic. I mean, isolation, people aren't getting out of the house, economic right. stresses, people cannot right. work, they're not making money. And then for the people who are already fighting drug addiction, their support systems are gone. You know, before you're going to group therapy, before you're seeing a friend, before you're going to NA meetings, AA meetings, all that went away. That's what increased the use of drugs, which in turn also increased the use of overdoses, specifically fentanyl. So I was just reading this article today about how in Columbus, Ohio, you know, home of the Ohio State University, they were talking about fentanyl. In the last couple of years, there have been an average of 700 overdose deaths in that county alone from fentanyl. And because of that, the university is advising students and coming back to campus to bring with them, among other things, fentanyl strips actually bring fentanyl strips, detection strips with them to try to keep them safe. Well, as you prepare for your kids to go back to school, experts say you need to put a tough conversation on the checklist, educating your kids about fentanyl. Fentanyl is 50 times more potent than heroin and the amount a size of a pencil tip can be deadly. It has made its way into every other type of drug, often without users knowing it. Both a grieving mother and a substance use expert told me it's time to be honest with your children. Tell me what the difference is between a fentanyl strip and what your company has worked on. And does it give you any comfort as a parent in using either one? Unfortunately, this is the place we're at today. You know, school supply list before it was sleeping bags, binders and folders. Now you have fentanyl strips. Fentanyl strips and Narcan are available in libraries. Just walk in, they'll give them to you. Narcan is naloxone, and it's essentially a opiate antagonist. And what that does, it keeps somebody alive long enough to get medical attention while they're overdosing. Mm-hmm. The other option you mentioned are the te- fentanyl testing strips. Not all testing strips are made equal. Some are more accurate than others. Some produce false negatives, which is scary. Some produce false positives, which ends up losing faith and confidence in the product. Right. I give you an example of what one looks like. They typically come in a little pouch. Um, They're single use, disposable. Um, They're pretty small. To use a strip, you need to get a glass, you need to get distilled water, find an accurate measuring scoop, measure the right amount of substance, depending on the substance, what it is, mix it into your water, you take your strip, dip it in to get a read. It takes you about three to five minutes to get a read. We're definitely advocating for people to test regardless of what they're using. But when we looked at the fentanyl testing strips, knowing that this is essentially the best option out there, unless you want to wait till you're overdosing and use Narcan, we said, okay, how can we make that process more user-friendly? Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of these strips, you know, being told to be, to bring in school supplies, they're also being distributed in the homeless community. And imagine just reenacting that process I just did. Wow. In a tent here at Skid Row, and it, it's just not going to happen. Or somebody at a party or somebody at a festival, it, most likely it's going to be less common for someone to be willing to do that process. The Mission is great, but the process is complex and it's too many steps to use in drug consumption environment. So we teamed up with some of the best bioscience product engineers. We've been working on it for about eight months now. Uh, we're ready to release our product. Our product's called Defend. It's the size of a lighter. By design, it's supposed to look like something in somebody's purse regularly, like a makeup or chapstick or lighter, but it's three simple steps. You open your scoop, scoop any substance you want, put it back in the device, you shake it up, twist the bottom, lay it down, and then you get a read. The big reason of why I mentioned the accuracy of the strips, some can be very accurate, but you need controls. You need a 
the same amount of water to test every time. You need the same scoop size, sample size to test every time. It's not very easy to actually replicate the controlled environment with the strip. So that's why we developed Defend. That puts a lot of pressure on the user, right? I say the user, the user of the test kit to get it all right, because if you get 80% of it right, Ahmad, but you miss the other 20, it's not going to be an accurate read. And yet, I think what I'm hearing from you, at least as a start out of the box, it's better than nothing, because having no detection at all leaves everybody completely vulnerable to the unknown, right? Correct. Correct. Um, again, our mission is to remind people to always test. If the strips are working for you, you're doing it in a controlled environment, you're measuring accurate, great, keep on doing it. If the strip is not working for you, we're just another option out there. It is the only all-in-one um, fentanyl detection device in the market today. Well, that's important because I was reading that Senator Cornyn, the U.S. Senator from Texas, was calling for national legislation to fund these fentanyl strips. And I remember back in the early days of COVID, when we first started using these test kits, those evolved very quickly from the first ones to the ones that became more popular and more in regular use that are still in use today. Is this something that the government needs to broaden out and talk about continuing to find the best way to detect as they come out of the box on detection, because this literally fentanyl is a killer? You know, if you remember about 20, 30 years ago, nobody really wore a seatbelt. Right. And car manufacturers, you started to have to put that beeping sound, you'll go deaf if you don't listen to it and you just end up putting your seatbelt on. What our objective of what our company is trying to do, we want to be the beeping sound. Our marketing, if it's successful, we want to be the beeping sound of drug testing. No matter what, always test your drugs. So what got you involved in all this? Give us a little bit of your history that led you to the moment where you're now involved in trying to save lives with these detection devices. You know, it's a... Uh, a combination of two things. Uh, my background in the diagnostic space, um, we were a small company pre-COVID and throughout COVID, we quickly, I think it was in three months, we grew to 400 staff members and only a matter of a few short months. Tie that into a, a personal agenda where I've unfortunately lost family members to overdoses. I've lost friends to opiate overdoses. The idea that it's spreading to everyone. I'm a father. I have my own children. So knowing that out there, there's parents losing their kids because their kid experimented with a Xanax or a Vicodin. Right. And they're being poisoned. And so knowing that this is what our society is coming to, it's become a personal agenda to make a change, to use our distribution outlets, to use our relationships, to use our technology from our diagnostic labs to actually make a difference listen to the news and they talk about fentanyl, usually you hear two kinds of stories. One, it's coming over the border, right? Which has become a big yeah. uh, political issue. And two is the number of people that are dying. Those are the two storylines you seem to get all the time. What you're not hearing, Ahmad, is you're not hearing what we can do about it. Yeah, I think it's a multi-solution approach. Most of the fentanyl has been coming from China, going south of the border. The fentanyl is being mixed into, again, everyday drugs. And these manufacturers are really good at creating counterfeits. The Xanax you get from a drugstore looks mm -hmm. exactly like the counterfeit one. So yes, it is coming over the border by the millions. To your point, I do believe that the government needs to get more involved today. As we speak today, there's about nine states that still consider this test strip or our product as drug paraphernalia. How could that be? They'll say, hey, this is promoting drug use. You're creating a, a better way to do drugs. So that number used to be 21 a little over a year ago. So it is dropping. Uh, of those nine states, half of them are in legislation to turn that around. But yeah, the government does need to really continue to sound the alarm of how big of a problem this is. And it's only getting worse. You know, To your point, you said the war on drugs has been decades, and you're right. But we've been under an opiate public health emergency since 2017. Hmm. And the opiate deaths are going up every single year. So that's six years now going on our seventh. Imagine COVID every single year for six years kept getting worse, worse and worse. As a parent advising a child going off to college, going back to the, the Ohio State University or any place of higher learning, 
What do you tell your kids in the now environment where fentanyl and other things like that are so incredibly lethal? My kids are still young, um, so they're a little ways from college, but just identifying with other parents and what they're probably feeling. I think the first thing you said is the most important is telling your kids something, is communicating. I think a lot of parents still have a hard time having those difficult conversations, but this is a difficult conversation that has to happen. So the first step is communicating with your kids, communicating with your peers, peer to peers. Other students should talk to other students as well. Uh, the schools should talk about it. Turning a blind eye, acting like this is not a problem, it's a problem. It also wouldn't be a public health emergency. So I think the first step is to talk about the dangers of what's out there in the market and the reality of all it takes is one hit of anything right. that can kill you. So this is going to take um, maybe a little humility and some humbleness from the parents of understanding, hey, I can't tell my kids to never consume a drug because the odds of that happening are pretty limited. So at least if I'm going to accept that, I need to be able to tell them if you're going to consume any drug, I don't care if your friend said he tested it. I don't care if your girlfriend said they tested it. You yourself need to test it yourself. I wish you well. We all wish you well. I mean, this is something that we got to figure out. We have to figure out as soon as we possibly can, because every time that clock ticks, we know someone else is in trouble, if not worse. And I think, you know, what you're working on and people like you are working on is going to be incredibly important for all of us. So please do it, do it well and do it as quickly as you can, because I think the country needs it like yesterday. Yeah, thank you, Adam. And I appreciate you setting a stage to help us deliver our message to the rest of the country. It's that important, Ahmad. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Don't miss future episodes by following us on Apple, Spotify, or other podcast platforms. Or go to the YouTube channel where you can subscribe for free.